In this lecture, I will discuss the concepts associated with motion along a straight line. In this chapter, as well as in chapter 4, I'm going to discuss the branch of physics known as kinematics. Kinematics is the classification and comparison of motions of objects. For this specific chapter, we're going to restrict motion in three ways. We will consider motion along a straight line only. We discuss only the motion itself, and we will not be interested in the forces that cause the motion. And finally, we consider the moving object to be a particle. So even if the object has a finite size, we are going to consider the motion of this object as the motion of a particle with the same mass. A particle is defined as either a point-like object, such as an electron, or an object that moves such that each part travels in the same direction at the same rate. So there is no rotation or stretching. In order to describe the motion of an object, it is important to first be able to define or identify the position in space of that moving object. In, a, in order to do that, we need a reference frame or a coordinate system in which we are going to measure the position of this object. Since we are dealing with one dimensional problem in this lecture, my reference frame will simply be a straight line, such as the one shown in the figure here, in which an origin is defined. Here is the origin, and we have directions. We have a positive direction, which is selected to be to the right, and a negative direction, which is selected to be to the left. So, to the right of the origin, we are moving in positive direction. To the left of the origin, we are moving in negative direction. This one-dimensional coordinate axis is labeled with x, and the units will be meters since we are measuring position. Since we have a positive and negative direction, that implies that the position of an object, depending on which side of the origin it is, can be a positive number or a negative number. So, for example, here is my one-dimensional coordinate system. Let's take a point particle and place it right here. So then the position will be equal to plus 2 meters. This is measured from the origin. If I grab a different particle and place it right here, then the position of this particle will be equal to negative 3 meters, also measured from the origin. Now let's look at something else. Let's consider a particle that initially was at plus one meters position from the origin. So let's call this the initial position of the particle and let's label that with x1. So the initial position of this particle, x1, is plus one meters. And then the particle moved to a different position at plus 4 meters from the origin. I'm going to call this the final position of the particle and I will label that with x2 and that is plus 4 meters. So now I have an evolution of the motion of the particle. The particle was initially at plus 1 meters from the origin and then it moved to plus 4 meters from the origin. I know the two positions of the particle the initial position and the final position. Therefore, I can calculate the displacement of the particle from its initial position to the final position. And so, a change in position is called displacement. The displacement is labeled with delta x, and it is defined as the change in position x, as the final position minus the initial position. Or in other words, as a formula, the displacement delta x is equal to the final position x2 minus the initial position x1. So in terms of my example, 
the displacement of this particle defined with the formula that I just stated will be the final position x2 minus the initial position x1. So this is plus 4 meters minus plus 1 meter. This is positive 3 meters. There is a significance to this positive sign here that I showed, and that will come clear very soon. Let's look at several uh, more examples of calculating of calculation of displacement of a moving particle. Let's have the particle at, at, at an initial position of 5 meters, and then the particle moves to another position x2, which is 2 meters from the origin. Let's calculate the displacement in this particular example. The displacement is calculated as the final position minus the initial position, so that is 2 meters minus 5 meters, that is negative 3 meters. So now we get a negative sign in front of the displacement. Now let's look at another example that is a little bit more complicated. So, the particle is initially at minus 2 meters from the origin, that's the initial position x1. Then it moves to another position x2, which is 4 meters from the origin. And then it moves back to the starting position at minus 2 meters. What is the displacement of the particle? So the definition of the displacement states that delta x is equal to the final position, which here that's x3, minus the initial position, x1. So that is minus 2 meters, minus minus 2 meters, or that is 0 meters. So when a particle starts from a certain position, and after it's done moving, ends up at that same position, the net displacement is 0. And so in the examples that I showed so far, for the displacement of the moving particle, we got a positive sign and a negative sign. And so that means that there is directionality associated with the concept of displacement. In physics, quantities that, uh, have def uh, that are defined with their magnitude and also direction are known as vector quantities. And so, when I calculated displacement, we had direction, which uh, was shown through the sign of the calculated displacement, and magnitude, which came through the actual number associated with the displacement. So here we have negative 3 meters. The direction is given by the minus sign, the magnitude by the value of the displacement. Here we had positive 3 meters, so the direction is given by the positive sign and the magnitude by the value of the displacement. So from the definition of vector quantities, it follows that displacement is also a vector quantity. So when, uh, so the direction will be given along the single axis, the single horizontal axis, and the direction will be indicated by the positive by a positive or negative sign, depending on what the calculation of the displacement yields. And then magnitude of the displacement will be the length or distance in the um, units used for the calculation that the particle is traveling between the final and initial positions. When we calculate the displacement, if we ignore the sign, we get the magnitude of the displacement. So for example, if the displacement is calculated as negative four meters, the magnitude of the displacement is four meters. I want to stress one more time the importance of the signs when displacement is calculated. Since displacement is a vector quantity and it has direction, it is very important to be very careful with the signs of the positions of the object as it's moving as it's moving when the displacement is calculated because the correct choice of signs will lead to correct sign for the displacement since the displacement is a vector quantity that is very important now we are ready to talk about the average velocity of a moving object the average velocity is this defined as the ratio of the displacement of the object delta, Hicks, uh, delta x to the time interval 
for which that displacement occurred. This time interval we label with delta t. So the average velocity, v average, is equal to delta x divided by delta t. And from the definition of delta x, that um, can be written as x2 minus x1. And of course, delta t will be t2 minus t1. t2 corresponds to the time stamp when the particle is at position x2. t1 corresponds to the time stamp when the object or particle is at position x1. The average velocity therefore has units of distance divided by time and in the metric system the base unit for uh, average velocity will be meters per second. Another unit that uh, is also um, used in some problems would be kilometers per hour. Since the average velocity is defined as the ratio of the displacement, which is a vector quantity, divided by time, which is a scalar quantity, so it, it has only magnitude, that means that the average velocity is also a vector quantity. So the average velocity essentially is proportional to the displacement. Now let's look at the graphical representation of average velocity. What is the meaning of average velocity graphically? So here we have a graph of position versus time for a moving object. If I select two positions during the motion of this object, uh, of course there are certain time stamps that correspond to those two positions. So therefore, if I draw a straight line between the two positions, I can calculate the slope of those two uh, of that straight line. And the slope is calculated as the change in position delta x. So this is the difference between the final position and the initial position, divided by the change in time as the object is moving. So this is the final time minus the initial time, or the time at the final position minus the time at the initial position. But from the graph here, that corresponds to the slope of the straight line. And so, the average velocity is the slope of the straight line that connects the two points along the trajectory of this moving object. I already said that the average velocity is a vector quantity. When the slope of this straight line is positive, that means that the average velocity is positive. When the slope is negative, it means that the average velocity is negative. I can define one more quantity um, associated with um, the average velocity, and that is the average speed. The average speed is defined as the total distance covered divided by the time interval in which that distance was covered delta t. So the average speed as average is equal to the total distance divided by delta t. The average speed is always positive. This is a scalar quantity. It does not have direction. The average speed is the magnitude of the average velocity. For example, if a particle is moving from 3 meters to negative 3 meters, so initial position, final position, in 2 seconds, from the definition of average velocity, it can be calculated that the average velocity is negative 3 meters per second. The average speed is the total distance divided by the time, so that will be 3 meters per second. Let's sketch this problem in a coordinate system to see how these numbers come up. So the particle starts at 3 meters, position, initial position of positive 3 meters, and at final position of negative 3 meters. Let's calculate the average velocity first. So we have that the average velocity is equal to delta x divided by delta t, that is x2 minus x1 divided by delta t. x2 is negative 3 meters minus x1 is positive 3 meters divided by 2 seconds. So minus 3 meters minus 
3 meters is equal to negative 6 meters divided by 2 seconds gives us minus 3 meters per second, and that is the average velocity. The minus sign indicates that the average velocity, remember that's a vector quantity, is directed in negative direction. So the object or particle is moving to the left. Now let's calculate the average speed. The average speed is calculated as the distance traveled divided by the time. Okay, well what is the distance traveled? The distance traveled is 6 meters from positive 3 to negative 3. So the total distance is 6 meters. The time of travel is 2 seconds. So therefore the average speed is 6 meters divided by 2 seconds. This is equal to 3 meters per second. So, when we state the velocity of motion of an object, it contains more information compared to the speed of the, motion of the object. Because the velocity tells us not only how fast the object is moving, but the direction of motion as well. The speed only tells us how fast the object is moving. So a simple example would be, I'm driving at 60 miles per hour. This information only tells us the speed of motion. But when I say I'm driving 60 miles per hour north, now I'm giving my velocity, which tells us the direction of motion as well. Now let's talk about the concept of instantaneous velocity. So when I discuss the definition of average velocity graphically, as you can see here, the I needed to know two positions of this moving object in order to calculate the slope of this straight line that passes through those two points. And this slope was equal to the average velocity. So this calculation relies on knowing two pieces of information, the two positions and of course the timestamps that correspond to those two positions. However, I have no way of knowing anything about the velocity of motion in between those two points. What if I wanted to know the velocity of motion at a specific position during the motion? That will require to define velocity in a slightly different way. That will require to define the velocity at a particular instance of time or instant of time and so therefore I'm going to call this velocity instantaneous velocity. So let's talk about instantaneous velocity. So let's look at the position versus time graph of the motion of an object and this is the trajectory of the moving object. So I know that if I select two points, initial position and final position, I can calculate the average velocity of motion between those two points. Okay, but of course I can also select the final position x2 to be closer to the initial position x1. So instead of having x2 right here, I can move it closer and have it right here instead. Let's call this one x2 prime. So now I can calculate the average velocity again between those two positions. Of course, the time interval between those two positions is smaller compared to the previous selection of the final position. But that's okay. I still can use my definition to calculate the average velocity. Okay, but now I can also make another selection and bring the final position Let's call it x2 second. So I can select this one closer to the even closer to the initial position. So still there is some distance between the two. Therefore, the, diff the time interval between the two will be still finite. I can still apply my definition for average velocity and calculate it. But imagine I do more of those steps and bring the final position closer and closer 
to the initial position. So I'm going to keep on bringing the final position closer and closer to the initial position. That is going to also shrink the time interval between, you know, the two positions until the time interval becomes so small that essentially I'm calculating the velocity at a specific point of the trajectory of the moving object. When that happens, I'm calculating the instantaneous velocity. What does that look graphically? So, for the first set of initial and final positions, here and here, I can calculate the average velocity by calculating the slope of this straight line. Then I moved the final position closer, and so then the average velocity will be calculated as the slope of the straight line that passes through those two. But as I'm bringing the um, initial and final positions closer and closer and closer, at some point they essentially overlap each other. And I'm really calculating the slope of a line that passes through that point. And so that would be this line. So the slope of this straight line will be equal to the instantaneous velocity, which I'm going to call V. And so now I'm ready to store of, say, a state, the definition of instantaneous velocity. So the instantaneous velocity, or just the velocity V, is at a single moment in time obtained from the average velocity by shrinking the time interval delta T. It is also the slope of the position time curve for a particle at an instant. This is also known as the derivative of position. The instantaneous velocity is a vector quantity with units of distance divided by time. So that means meters per second or possibly kilometers per hour. And the sign of the velocity represents its direction. The instantaneous velocity V is defined as the limit when the time interval approaches zero of the average velocity delta x divided by delta t. And the notation for instantaneous velocity is dx dt. And this is known as the first time derivative of the position, where the position is x. So when we are calculating instantaneous velocity, we must know the position function as a function of time of the moving particle. And then we perform the first time derivative of that position function, and we get the um, velocity of the particle. And so here is an example that um, I want to do for you to illustrate how to calculate average velocity and instantaneous velocity. Find an expression for the instantaneous velocity of a body whose position is described as a function of time by x of t is equal to 8t squared minus 4t plus 6 meters. After the instantaneous velocity is calculated, what's the instantaneous velocity for t equals 0 seconds, 1 second, 2 seconds, and 3 seconds? And also, what are the average velocities for uh, of the body from uh, for the time interval between zero and three seconds? To calculate the instantaneous velocity, the definition was the time derivative of the position function. So that means that we have to um, do derivatives. So here is a gen general rule for performing that operation. So if I have some um, expression that um, has a variable p to the nth power, 
if I'm taking the first derivative with respect to p, so we write this as d dp of p to the nth power, that will be equal to n, so that is the original power, times p to a power n minus 1. So the derivative multiplies by the, power, the original power n, and then 1 is subtracted from the original power, and that is the new exponent for p. So let's use this general definition to calculate the instantaneous velocity using this position function right here. So the definition of the instantaneous velocity v is the first time derivative d dt of the position function x of t. This notation here um, tells us that the position function x is a function of time. And so substituting x of t with the expression provided in the statement of the problem, I get d dt of 8t squared minus 4t plus 6. So the definition of a derivative that I stated above here has no, doesn't say anything about when we have a sum of terms like so. However, the distributive for, uh, property just works. Uh, it, we can use that here. And so basically I'm going to do the time derivative of the first term minus the time derivative of the second term plus the time derivative of the, ter the third term. So I basically will apply ddt to each term separately, and then I'm going to add them with their proper signs as I see them. So I get ddt of 8t squared minus ddt of 4t plus ddt of 6. The units will be meters per second since I'm calculating velocity. Now let's state a few more rules of derivatives. If I take the derivative ddp of a times p where a is a constant, the derivative can go of the uh, constant a comes in front of the derivative and then I just take the derivative of p. So ddp of a times p is equal to a times dp of p. And then if I have the derivative ddp of a constant a, that gives me a zero. So those two conditions or um, possibilities I see in the two terms here and here. So we have ddt of 4 times t, so 4 is a constant, so based on this rule right here, 4 is going to come in front of the derivative. And the last term, ddt of 6, that is a derivative uh, from a, of a constant that should give us a zero. In the first term, I have similar situation as that second condition here. I have an 8, which is a constant, and then I have times t to the second power. So this constant is going to come in front of the derivative, and then I will have d dt of t squared times 8. So let's write this down. So we get a times d dt of t squared minus 4 times d dt of t plus 0. Now I'm going to use the first rule of derivatives that I stated here to perform the derivatives for those two terms. So the first term gives me 8. And then the derivative d dt of t squared by the rule from the previous slide will give me 2 times t to 2 minus 1, so that's t to the first power. So we get 8 right here times 2 times t. The second term, we have the derivative d dt of t, so that t here is to the first power. So therefore, from the rule of derivatives, that's going to give me 1 times t to 1 minus 1, which is 0. And so any quantity raised to power of 0 gives us 1. So therefore, this whole expression here will be minus 4, right here. And so now the final result is that the instantaneous velocity v is equal to 16t minus 4 meters per second. As you can see, the, final, the instantaneous velocity is a function of time.
It has a term that depends on time. So therefore, the instantaneous velocity changes as the time passes. So the second part of the problem, part B, was asking to find the instantaneous velocity for times t equals 0 seconds, 1, 2, and 3 seconds. So we want to find the velocity at t0, 1, 2, and 3 seconds. I already have the expression for the velocity, so all I really need to do is replace t with 0, 1, 2, and 3 seconds and calculate the result. And so at 0 seconds, um, we have 16 times 0 minus 4. That is, this is negative um, 4 meters per second. So this is at t equals 0 seconds. So the object is moving in negative um, x direction. At t equal 1 seconds, we have 16 times 1 minus 4. That will be equal to 16 minus 4. That is positive 12 meters per second. So it means that the object was moving to initially at t equal 0 seconds to the left, but then it switched directions. And uh, at t equal 1 seconds, it was already moving in positive direction with 12 meters per second. At t equal to 2 seconds, the instantaneous velocity is 28 meters per second. And then at t equal to 3 seconds, the instantaneous velocity is 44 meters per second. So here is the um, summary of how we obtain instantaneous velocity. We know the position function as a function of time. Then we take the first time derivative of that position function, and we end up with some expression for the instantaneous velocity which can be which may be a function of time depending on the position function and then if we want to find instantaneous velocity at various moments of time we are going to substitute those values for the time in the expression for the instantaneous velocity for example like here to find the instantaneous velocity at those different instances of time if the instantaneous velocity is not a function of time it's just a number then that means that the motion is with constant velocity and that velocity will not change as the object is moving. The third part of the question was to calculate the average velocity of this moving body between the interval of, uh, between timestamps of zero seconds and three seconds. So the um, average velocity is calculated as the displacement x2 minus x1 divided by the time interval between the two positions. So since the average velocity definition involves the position of the object at two different points in space, that means that I will use the position function at and calculate the position at those two different moments of time. So I must calculate the position at t equals zero seconds and the position at t equals three seconds. And so the initial position x1 happens when the time is equal to 0 seconds. So we have 8 times 0 squared minus 4 times 0 plus 6. This is equal to 6 meters. At t equal to 3 seconds, we have 8 times 3 squared minus 4 times 3 plus 6 meters. So that's 72 minus 12 plus 6, or that is 66 meters, and that is at t equal to 3 seconds. So the initial position is 6 meters. The initial position is 6 meters. The final position is 66 meters. And we know that the time interval between the two positions is 3 seconds. So now I can calculate the average velocity. So the average velocity is 66 meters minus 6 meters divided by 3 seconds. That is 60 meters divided by 3 seconds, or that is 20 meters per second. And this is in positive x direction. So to summarize the calculation of the average velocity, the average velocity is defined as the difference in uh, is the displacement between two positions divided by the time interval between those two positions or for that displacement to take place. So that means that from the position function that's provided in the problem, you must calculate the position at each moment of time and then um, use the definition of average velocity to calculate it. Okay, so now we are ready to talk about acceleration. So the change in a particle's velocity with time is called acceleration. And we have two types of acceleration. We have average acceleration, which is defined as the change in velocity divided by the interval of time or the elapsed time between 
for, for that change to happen. And so the average acceleration is uh, calculated as delta V divided by delta T. And then we have instantaneous acceleration or simply acceleration A, which is calculated at an instant of time. And is calculated as the time derivative of the instantaneous velocity. So again, the average acceleration is equal to the change in velocity divided by the elapsed time for that change to occur. The instantaneous acceleration is the time derivative of the instantaneous velocity. The meaning of the average acceleration is simply the slope of the curve of the curve in a velocity versus time plot for the instantaneous uh, between two points for the instantaneous acceleration that is the slope of the tangent at a single point of the curve in a velocity versus time graph since the acceleration is defined through the velocity the average acceleration through the average velocity and instantaneous acceleration through the instantaneous uh, velocity. That means that the acceleration, the average and instantaneous accelerations are vector quantities. A positive sign for the acceleration means that um, the acceleration is in positive direction. A negative sign means that the acceleration points in negative direction. And the units for acceleration are the units of distance divided by time to the second power. And so in the metric system, the units that are used for acceleration are meters per second squared. Since the velocity and acceleration are both vector quantities, when an object is moving along a straight line, we have several possibilities for those two vectors as far as their directions are concerned. If the signs of the velocity and acceleration of a particle are the same, the speed of the particle increases. If the signs are opposite, the speed decreases. What does that mean? So consider this particle that is moving in positive x direction. If the velocity vector and the acceleration vector point in the same direction, then the velocity of this particle as it moves will be increasing. The same applies if the particle is moving in negative direction. So here is another particle moving in negative direction. The velocity and acceleration vectors point in the same direction, in negative direction. That means that with time, the velocity of this particle will be increasing. However, if that particle here is moving in positive x direction, so the velocity points in positive x direction, but the acceleration of the particle is in negative x direction, the velocity will be decreasing. And if we look at this other particle, which is moving in negative x direction, with velocity pointing in negative x direction, but the acceleration of that particle points in positive x direction, then the velocity will be decreasing. So, any time that the velocity and, uh, and acceleration vectors are in the same direction, the velocity will be increasing. <clears throat> and any time when the velocity and acceleration vectors point in opposite directions, the velocity will be decreasing. So now let's do an example that uses the definitions of instantaneous and average acceleration to calculate those accelerations when we know the velocity of a moving object is a function of time. So the velocity of a particle moving along the x-axis is given by v of t equals to 25 plus 5t minus 4t squared meters per second. First, find an expression for the instantaneous acceleration of the particle. Then find the acceleration of the particle at t equals 0, 1, 2, and 3 seconds. And finally, what is the average acceleration of the particle from 0 seconds to 3 seconds? So, the instantaneous acceleration is a time derivative of the velocity function. So I'm going to perform that operation the same way I performed it for the instantaneous velocity in the previous example to calculate the instantaneous acceleration this time. So I have ddt of the velocity function v of t, which becomes ddt of 25 plus 5t minus 4t squared 
meters per second. So I'm going to use the same rules for derivatives that I already explained in the previous example to perform the derivatives. So I'm going to first split the expression into three separate derivatives added together. So we have ddt of 25. 25 is a constant, so by the rules explained before, this first term should be equal to 0, plus ddt of 5t. So that will become 5 times d t dt plus ddt of negative 4 times t squared. So this should become minus 4 times ddt of t squared. And the units now are meters per second squared since I'm calculating acceleration. And so we get 0 from the first term, ddt of 25, plus 5 times dt of t, that's from the second term, minus 4 times ddt of t squared, that's from the third term. So the second term here gives us just 5, since ddt of t is equal to 1. And the second term gives us negative 8 times t, since d dt of t squared is equal to 2 times t. So uh, minus 4 times 2 t will give us negative 8 t. So the instantaneous acceleration is equal to 5 minus 8 t meters per second squared and as you can see it depends on the time so therefore depending on the time um, of stamp of the measurement of the acceleration that acceleration will have different values we are asked to calculate the acceleration at t equals zero seconds one two and three seconds so let's do that and so at t equals zero seconds the Instantaneous acceleration is 5 minus 8 times 0, or 5 meters per second squared. At t equal 1 second, the instantaneous acceleration is 5 minus 8, so that's negative 3 meters per second squared. At t equal to 2 seconds, we have 5 minus 8 times 2, so that's negative 11 meters per second squared. And at um, t equal to 3 seconds, we have 5 minus 8 times 3, that is negative 19 meters per second squared. So the recipe for calculating instantaneous acceleration is to take the velocity function, take the first time derivative out of it, and then substitute the specific moment of time you're interested in and calculate the value of the acceleration. Now the last part of the problem asked to find the average acceleration between t equals 0 seconds and t equals 3 seconds. That means that first I must calculate the velocity at those times. So the velocity as a function of time is equal to 25 plus 5t minus 4t squared, and this is meters per second. So I must find the value of that function at t equal to 0 seconds and t equal to 3 seconds. Let's do that first. And then I'm going to use the definition of average acceleration to calculate it. So the velocity at t equal to 0 seconds is equal to 25 meters per second. And then the velocity at 3 seconds is equal to 4 meters per second. So now I can use the definition of average acceleration, which states that the average acceleration is equal to the change in velocity divided by the time interval between those two velocity values. So that would be equal to 4 meters per second minus 24, 25 meters per second divided by 3 seconds. And that is equal to negative 7 meters per second squared. In many cases, and what we are basically going to deal with predominantly in this course, we have accelerated motion which happens with constant acceleration. In this case, five special equations can be used to describe the motion of objects with constant acceleration, or the motion with constant acceleration. So if I plot acceleration versus time, like shown right here, since the acceleration is constant, the plot will look like so. Acceleration is a horizontal straight line. The consequence of that is that the velocity versus time plot will be essentially a straight line with a constant slope. 
And then, because of that, the position versus time plot will be a um, curve with varying slope, just as shown. So the position versus time plot for a motion with constant acceleration is not a straight line, is a curve with varying slope. The derivation of those five equations can be found in the textbook. I'm not going to go over those to save some time. The final result, though, is that we get relationships between initial velocity, final velocity, acceleration, time, and displacement. So, the first relationship here gives us the relationship between the final velocity v, the initial velocity v0, the acceler acceleration of motion a, and the time t. The second equation gives us a relationship between the displacement x minus x0, final position minus initial position, the initial velocity v0, the time of motion t, and the acceleration of motion a. The third relationship here gives us a link between the final velocity, initial velocity, acceleration, and displacement. The fourth gives us a relationship between the displacement, initial and final velocities, and time. And the last one is used when we have a relationship. It is, gives us a relationship between the displacement, the final velocity, and time acceleration. And so those five equations can solve or can be used to solve any problem involving motion with constant acceleration. As you can see in each equation, we have four variables. The number of variables in total for those types of problems is five. One, two, three, four, five. Each equation links four of them. So essentially, when you're solving a problem, you could look at the equations, see which equations have the variables that you have stated in the problem, and which equations will help you find variables that you need but you don't know explicitly, and work with those equations to solve your problem. In some cases, a problem involving motion with constant acceleration can be divided into stages of the motion. So in the first stage, you'll have an initial velocity, um, acceleration, time, fi final velocity conditions. And let's say you actually don't know the final velocity, but you can uh, don't know the final velocity, but you can find it. This final velocity now becomes the initial velocity for the second stage of motion. In the second stage of motion, second stage of motion, you can uh, you may have to find another velocity at the end of that stage of motion. This velocity will now become the initial velocity for the third stage of motion, and so on and so forth. So essentially, in each previous stage, all the variables that you have determined that are final variables for that stage become initial variables for the new stage. A specific type of motion with constant acceleration is the free fall motion. Free fall motion is the motion that objects left to fall on their own towards the center of the Earth experience. These mo uh, objects move with constant acceleration, which is known as the free fall acceleration. The free fall acceleration is the rate at which an object accelerates downward in the absence of air resistance. The free fall acceleration varies with our latitude and elevation. And the reason for that is because the Earth is not perfectly spherical. The free fall acceleration is written as G. And the standard value for the free fall acceleration is taken to be 9.8 meters per second squared. The free fall acceleration is independent of the properties of the object, such as mass, density, shape, and so on. The equations of motion in the previous table apply to objects in free fall near Earth's surface. 
However, a substitution of some of the, of the variables are necessary in order to indicate proper direction of motion. It is also very important to ignore air resistance because in the presence of air resistance, the free fall acceleration can change. The free fall acceleration is downward in minus y direction. And the value of negative g in the constant acceleration equations must be added. So let's look at how these equations change for specifically free falling motion. So first of all, when we are considering vertical motion, we are going to use a y axis for that motion. Um, so we are going to reserve the x axis for horizontal motion, the y axis for vertical motion. So the standard um, convention is that the positive y axis is directed upwards and negative y axis is directed down. The surface of the earth will be aligned with the positive x axis. So this is the earth. And so we know that the acceleration due to gravity always points down. And so therefore, we must use that acceleration with the negative sign when we are using the kinematic equations from table 2.1. So let's look at those equations and how they change based on the new variables that I just introduced, meaning y coordinates and gravitational acceleration g. So the first equation becomes v is equal to v0 minus gt. Here, this minus sign accounts for the direction of the gravitational acceleration. So in this case, since we already have the minus sign taken care of, g is simply equal to 9.8 meters per second. The second equation, the vertical displacement, y minus y0 is equal to the initial velocity v0 times the time of motion t minus one half gt squared. So the difference between the equation for the horizontal direction of motion versus free fall vertically is this minus sign. But now since this minus sign has been selected, the value of g will be simply 9.8 meters per second squared. The third equation is v squared, so the final velocity squared is equal to the initial velocity squared plus 2 times g times the vertical displacement. Here, the change in sign is important with, compared to the, origin, uh, to the previous uh, equation for horizontal motion. And again, g is taken with the value of 9.8 meters per second squared, and so on and so forth. So, when the equations for free fall are written in that form, the signs here take care of the direction of the gravitational acceleration, and so the value that we use for g is simply 9.8 meters per second squared. This is the most important um, detail regarding free fall and acceleration. So, with this, I will conclude the lecture on motion along a straight line. And we are going to continue discussing kinematics of moving objects in chapter three in more than one dimensions, where we are going to simply expand the con concepts that I just discussed in terms of vectors, where things will get a little bit more um, diverse due to the nature of vector quantities and how we do calculations with them.